So I, I never really had a passion for computers. This may sound funny coming from somebody who was a computer science professor for almost 30 years, but it's true. Uh, at some point in my life, my parents decided that I should get a university education, so I had them sign me up for computer science, which I figured would be useful. And honestly, the first year I didn't pay too much attention, but then it grew on me. And when at some point I discovered artificial intelligence or AI, I got hooked. I still am hooked. And it's not so much because of self-driving cars or personal digital assistants, even though they're terribly important. I want to start by asking you six questions about what you think computers could do. Specifically, I want you to tell me whether, in your opinion, computers could think, understand, be creative, have feelings, have free will, and be conscious. I'm not talking about today's laptops or even the giant computer clusters of Google. I'm speaking about computers in principle, how they might be in 50 or 500 years. Imagine that you had to vote on these questions. You had to answer yes or no. You couldn't abstain. You couldn't hedge and say, well, it depends what you mean. How would you vote? Let's do an experiment. I'm going to ask you about whether computers can think, and you have to vote yes or no. Who's a yes? Raise your hand. Thank you. Who's a no? Raise your hand. Thank you. About 75% of you think yes, uh, and a lot of you didn't raise your hand, and I've got your names. <laughs> Let's do another experiment. Um, who thinks, and you have to vote, that computers could, in principle, have free will. If you're a yes, raise your hand. Thank you. All the no's, raise your hand. All right. Now I would say about 5% of you think computers could have free will. These are six questions that I used to ask at my class at Stanford uh, for many years, and I'd ask it twice, at the beginning of the course and at the end. And what invariably happened was that after we had discussed various aspects of artificial intelligence or AI and what it meant to compute, the phrase, of course, computers can't, tended to disappear. People were less sure of themselves, and the vote at the end of the course was much more favorable to computers. Now, in 15 minutes, I don't think we'll achieve quite a transformation, but I do hope we walk away with a new perspective and it's not only a perspective about computers. It's also, and perhaps mainly, a perspective about ourselves. As you know, AI is the science and technology of getting computers to do smart things that we usually associate with people. Things like playing chess, or speaking in English, or diagnosing a disease, telling a joke. What do we know about AI in early 2017? First of all, we know that everybody's speaking about it, from the New York Times, from the White House, to Dilbert. We also know that AI is hugely successful, especially in an area called machine learning. Computers can recognize cats and faces. They can drive cars. They can play recreational games extremely well, beating world champions. We know that industry is betting heavily on AI. We also know that people are worried, and there are two kinds of worry. The first kind is about negative implications of AI on society, mostly unintended implications. If cars can drive themselves, does that mean that thousands of drivers will lose their jobs? Will biases that exist in, say, job interviews or loan applications get amplified by algorithms? Will robotic soldiers behave unethically in the battlefield? These are very legitimate concerns, and they deserve our attention, as is the case with any disruptive technology. We must ensure fair and ethical applications of AI, and I think we can. But the second kind of worry is deeper. It's visceral, it's existential. It's the worry that we people won't be that special anymore that Westworld got it right. We won't be able to tell the people from the machines. There's a worst-case version of the worry in which the machines take over and replace us as the dominant species. 
You've seen this a lot in science fiction and also in recent popular books. Uh, you know the narrative. You know, we humans have made our contribution to evolution. Thank you very much, but our service is no longer needed. But even ignoring this evolutionary threat, which, by the way, I think is overblown, the question remains, is there something that separates us from machines? I'm going to answer this in two steps. First, I'll scare the hell out of you, and then I'll not only calm you down, but hopefully even excite you about the future. So first, the scary part, and I'll say it right now. I believe that computers will exist, exhibit most, if not all, of the traits that we view as uniquely human. And yes, that includes thinking and understanding and free will and all the rest. I'm not alone in thinking this. Most computer scientists I know tend to think this way. It includes, for example, uh, Alan Turing, perhaps the most brilliant computer science of all times. Among other things, Turing invented what we today call the Turing test, which is a practical test of whether a computer is intelligent. And Turing thought already in 1950 that there was no reason computers could not. And it includes John McCarthy, uh, the father of AI, uh, who coined the term in the 1950s. Now, some think this isn't real thinking or understanding. The thing is, I've yet to see a single good argument. Perhaps the best argument I've seen was given by Ada Lovelace. What makes her argument striking, by the way, is that she gave it in 1842, a century before Turing. She was a very talented writer, mathematician, society woman. She happened to be also the daughter of Lord Byron. And she's best known today for her work with Charles Babbage. Babbage was a, also a mathematician, and he invented the first general-purpose computer, although he never built it, uh, called the Analytical Engine. In notes that Lovelace wrote about the Analytical Engine, she included what many considered to be the first computer program in the world. And even more remarkably, she speculated about what today we would call artificial intelligence. Specifically, she argued against the possibility of the computer being creative. Let's see what she said. Very sensible. The computer just follows the instructions. It has no original thought. Think about this. This is 1842, a century before the first electronic computer. It's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing, but it's also flawed in two ways. First. While well, Lovelace's insight into computing was astounding for her time, by today's standards, it's naive. Today, AI is not characterized by handcrafted logical rules, but by machine learning operating on machines a million times more powerful than she could imagine, giving rise to programs that no human could have explicitly coded or even anticipated, whether these are programs that beat a world champion in the game of Go or paint fantastical paintings. The second flaw is even more basic. Notice, let's look again at what she wrote. Notice that she doesn't give an argument. She expresses her belief and appeals to our intuition. And that is the case with all the arguments that followed. They all boil down to the idea of, come on, this is ridiculous. It just seems obvious to the critics that the computer can never really understand or think or what have you. It can only mimic it superficially. Really? And how would you know the real thing if you saw it? It reminds me of one of the stories of the wise men of Helm, that fictional group of very silly people from Eastern European Jewish folklore. In this story, the man gets up in the morning and says goodbye to his wife and kids and sets out from the small town of uh, Helm to the big town city of Warsaw. And along the way, he gets lost uh, through some funny circumstances and ends back in Helm, but thinking he arrived in Warsaw. And he's struck by its resemblance to his hometown. There's a street just like his and a house very much like his and amazingly a family so much like his own family. Nice people, they invite him in, they feed him. And he wants, when he wants to leave, they won't let him. So he spends the rest of his life with these wonderful people, and he's always homesick. 
And that is how it is with the skeptics of AI. It doesn't matter if the computer walks like a duck and talks like a duck. For them, somehow the real thing is mysteriously different. Now, am I saying that I know for a fact that a computer will exhibit the full range of human mental activity? No. I'm quite sure about thinking and understanding. If you just look at even today's programs that diagnose diseases better than doctors, that approve loan applications much more reasonably than humans, that grade homework online, and so on, how good must they be before you concede that they understand what they're talking about? It may not be exactly our understanding, but we don't say that an airplane can't fly just because it doesn't fly like a bird. And I'm also quite sure about creativity. And it's not only because of that painting we saw earlier on. A recent version of Google Translate, the program that translates between languages like English and French, invented all on its own an internal language to, to help with this translation. It surprised everyone, not the least the people who wrote the program. And I'm told that expert Go programs were in awe of the originality of the AlphaGo program, so much so that they named one of the moves after the program. So I'm a yes on thinking, understanding, creativity. I tend to think that the same is true of things like feelings and free will and consciousness, although I'm not yet ready to argue it. These are more subtle notions. Certainly some have argued, like the late John McCarthy, who I mentioned earlier on. I myself think that the jury is still out, but I wouldn't bet against the machine. So this is scary. Computers can think, understand, be creative, and maybe even have feelings and free will and be conscious. That means that we're nothing but glorified laptops, perhaps to be replaced by a newer and better model. It doesn't feel very good, and it's so natural to reject an idea because it scares us. But fear is a very poor guide. And this is where the story gets happy again. If you just shift perspective, you see not a threat, but a very exciting opportunity. You see that it's not about the answers, it's about the questions. And it's not about computers versus humans, them versus us. It's not even about them at all. It's really about us. And that's for two reasons. First, computers already now extend our cognitive skills, but they tend to be physically separate and made of metal. But that'll change. Our nervous system will connect wirelessly to giant data centers, and our bloodstream will carry thousands of nanocomputers fighting diseases, so it'll be less clear where we end and the computer begins. But even more basically, we just don't understand these notions. Take free will. I'm sure that when you, you voted earlier on on, on on free will, you were asking yourself, well, what is it and what does it mean for me to have free will? That's certainly what the students in my class asked, and they quickly concluded that we don't know. Certainly, a ton has been written about it. I recently uh, spoke with a very smart friend of mine, a technologist who happens to be religious, and I asked him about the famous quote of Rabbi Akiva, a quote, Safui Barashut Netuna, all is foreseen and free will is granted. I asked him whether, in his opinion, it resolved the obvious tension between divine omniscience and free will. He admitted that probably not, although later he sent me some writing by his rabbi on it. Uh, philosophers, of course, have done battle with free will for a long time. For example, there's a wonderful story by the philosopher and logician Raymond Smullyan. The story is... No, really, this is not Dumbledore, this is Smullyan, although it's true that Smullyan was also a magician. The story is called, Is God a Taoist? And the moral of the story is that it makes no logical sense for a person to not want to have free will. Think about it, it's fascinating. Perhaps my favorite quote on free will comes from literature, from Isaac Peshevizinger's Nobel Prize speech, where he said, we have to believe in free will, we have no choice. <laughs> what all these quotes have in common is that they're clever, they're thought-provoking, they're entertaining, and they don't tell us what free will is. And we're in no better shape when it comes to consciousness, and perhaps only marginally better when it comes to feelings. So it's not that we don't understand computers, we don't understand ourselves. And this, to me, is where it gets exciting. You see, AI 
in addition to its practical contributions, is propelling us towards the ultimate intellectual frontier, understanding our minds, our souls, our selves. Because at the end, what do we care about? We certainly care about not dying of cold and hunger and not being eaten by predators, and that's also true of lizards. Uh, we want to love and be loved, and that's true of my dog. And then what? We have a sense that there's more to our life than survival and companionship. We don't end the day and we say, I wasn't eaten by a lion, that was a good day. We look back at the day, we look back at our life, and we take satisfaction in what? In what we've learned, on how we acted, on the impact we had on others, on the nice things people said about us. But for that to make sense, we have to think of ourselves as creatures with thoughts and beliefs and feelings, aware of ourselves and of each other, able to take our actions freely. So to understand ourselves, we need to understand these things. We have various tools for this. We have neuroscience, and yes, we have philosophy and the rest. But AI is giving us a really interesting new lens through which to think about these issues. The question, about whether, the question of whether machines can embody these notions. And we should ask this question boldly. Perhaps we'll find that essential nugget that separates us from machines, and certainly the contrast with machines will tell us something about ourselves. Perhaps we won't find that nugget. That will also tell us something about ourselves. And it wouldn't demean us either. Our sense of self-worth shouldn't depend on putting down the machine. In both cases, we learn something about ourselves. And as the great philosopher Martha Stewart said, that's a good thing. Before I end, I have a request. Please all go to the website couldcomputers.org and vote on these six questions. This goes to everyone here in the audience or watching it live elsewhere or recording later on. Please go ahead and vote. And you can vote many times. Uh, perhaps you'll read something interesting in the New York Times or Israel Ayom. Maybe you'll have a conversation with your yoga instructor. Maybe you'll hear an interesting TED talk. By all means, go ahead and re-vote. Uh, by the way, they should have allowed that for Brexit, but that's a different story. Uh, we will collect these votes and um, see how, as a society, we feel about these issues and how that evolved over time. And let's not only vote. Let's start a conversation about it. And if we're lucky, we will have a better understanding not only of computers and of AI, but also of what it means to be a human being. Thank you.